So um, we're going to do a little bit more strategy. We actually have quite a bit more to do, but um, I want to definitely do the Jollibee case tonight. So it's like it's almost nine. So I'm going to try to wrap this up. If we start to run out of time, I'll cut this short. We'll go to Jollibee and we'll leave Harley for tomorrow. Okay. So because um, I do want to talk about Harley, just may not have that much time tonight. So unless we go to like 11 or 12. I thought you would like that idea, but all right. Yeah, nice idea. <laughs> Sleep is optional, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I get emails from you all the time, so <laughs> I was wondering if you sleep or not. <laughs> Anyhow, the next thing is just a list of forces that might push you towards standardization or towards responsiveness, okay? At the end of the day, there are a tremendous number of trade-offs that you're making. And this is just like your checklist. You know, is, what about this thing? What about this thing? And what about this thing? That'll help you to come to a decision of what exactly are you going to do, OK? So pressures for cost reduction. As in, your other competitors have lower cost. You need the same economies of scale to get down to the price level. Or maybe, you know, if you don't have um, enough economies of scale, maybe um, consumers won't buy it at that price, right? It's too expensive and it's not the competitors, it's the consumer side that is pushing you down, okay? Second, um, pressures for local responsiveness are just, you know, there are differences in tastes and preferences. Now, the thing about this is the difference has to be big enough, right? Because consumers will accept some things that are not perfect. Okay, either because it's a Big Mac, which they've never experienced before, and they may wind up liking it, or because it is a washing machine, which is not perfect for Singaporean tastes, but the price is so much lower that they're willing to accept it and make some compromises. Okay, so you look at it, but you're not sure. Language is one of those areas where you tend to adapt, all right, especially instructions and so on. But do um, you guys buy things from um, IKEA? Is that in sync? Okay. Have you looked at their instructions? Yeah, obviously, right? It's a big, um, sort of a big joke about putting your furniture together. And what does IKEA do with their instructions to deal with the language? Yeah, exactly. So there are ways to get around this, right? And also the use of, for instance, English brand names in countries that don't speak English. It's fairly widely accepted. Um, and not just English, but that as an example. So you don't always have to adapt to language, okay? Um, laws, generally speaking, it's a good idea to adapt to the local laws, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> enough said. Um, infrastructure and local market practices. Um, how does Coke get distributed in rural China? What vehicle transports it? Bicycle, yeah, exactly. I mean, I even, somewhere I have a picture. I probably can't find it fast enough. But it's this incredibly banged up bicycle with a Coke box on the back of it and the lettering is flaking off and everything. And you look at this picture and you say, oh, this is what rural China is really like, right? So now if you're Coke and you have this global distribution network and you're used to big trucks and refrigeration and everything, if you want to sell in rural China, you're going to have to figure out to, how to make it work given the infrastructure that is there, right? Normally, even rich companies like Coke, normally they can't build it. I mean, even, even if you bought the trucks, maybe the roads aren't there, right? So some sort of adaptation is going to have to happen, okay? Um, and distribution channels, again, most of the time, you're not big enough to sort of build a channel. So what you do is you wind up going through what exists in the market already. Okay. Um, host country demands is just other government issues in particular for local joint venture partners or domestication or whatever. Right. Okay, so different types of strategy. International strategy, these are actually going to be in roughly chronological order. International strategy referred to an old way of expanding internationally, where what we did is um, we had a product, it was good, and we decided it would work in another market. We would basically replicate it in another country, 
Okay, so we'd build a factory in another country and do exactly the same thing. This worked back in the old days when um, markets were relatively unsophisticated and you didn't have to do so much adaptation. But it's, a, it's, not, it's not a sophisticated strategy. It's a very simple strategy. Okay? Remember um, Henry Ford and the car that only comes in one color? Okay? So after the United States, Ford expanded to Europe and he basically built exactly the same factory and sold exactly the same car. And obviously the car is not customized for Europe because everybody's so happy that they even have a car, right? It, like, it doesn't matter. But you can't get away with this type of strategy in a sophisticated competitive marketplace, right? You're going to have to move to the next level. So what came after international was the, um, oh, this is just an explanation, just basically transferring the same skills, same products. So um, it's very centralized very limited customization in that you just do the same thing in another country. It's okay. You just do the same thing in another country as you do at home. So, you know, it looks like a big deal, but in some ways it's not, right? It's a very simple international expansion, okay? So um, just replicating the marketing and the manufacturing that you do at home, right? Multi-domestic came next, and um, multi-domestic was when marketers sort of realized, like, hey, we're not going to be able to sell everybody the same car all around the world. We're going to have to do something a little bit better. And the first thought that basically occurred to people was we customize, okay? So we start giving colors, sizes, tastes, you know, um, cars with left-hand drive, right-hand drive, whatever it is that suits the local market. Part of this story comes out of the Second World War when firms were essentially cut off. And if you look at companies like Philips, you know Philips Electronics, right? Philips, the only way it could keep going is if the subsidiaries functioned independently, okay? Because headquarters was cut off from the other countries. And there was no communication, no possibility for exchange. And it developed this culture where um, local subsidiaries are incredibly independent. They have their own research and development, their own products, their own brands. And it can lead to some extreme situations, OK? Um, OK, remember VCRs. OK, VCRs are gone now. Amazingly enough, this product has already disappeared, right? But. Um, in the early days, there was more than one type of VCR. Okay, there was Betamax and um, VHS, and there was one more. It's actually called V2000, and it was Philips's standard. Okay, and Betamax was who? Sony. Okay, and VHS I think is Toshiba or not sure. Yeah. Which one was the best, by the way? Betamax was better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, the trick in this industry actually is not to have the best product, but to get your product accepted as a standard, right? And why is the standard so important? As consumers, we don't want to have three VCRs, right? <laughs> It's kind of silly. I mean, we will hold off on buying until we know which one is going to be successful. The same thing with high definition, with um, DVDs, right? Yeah. And it actually, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but it became a joke. It, the term to be Betamaxed means to be beaten by an inferior competitor. Okay? So if you ever hear somebody say that, you know, right. So V2000 was Philips' standard. So here's the story. 